What is the root of Mishkan? Anybody? Three letters. Pick three letters. Pick three letters. Mem Shin Kafnam. That's right. Give me three letters. Mem Shin That's your that's your suggestion. From those from those four? Yeah, I if I gave you four letters, give me three. Mishkan. Madrai? Okay. Mem Shin Kafnun. What's the root of Mem Shin Kafnun? Right? No? What do you mean by yeah, how wrong can you be? It's only, okay, I'm giving you three out of four. So how wrong can you be? I mean, you got a, you got three out of four chances of being right. <laughs> you got a seven, what? You say three letters. Three letters. Uh... Mem Shin, you want to do Mem Shin? Right. Right. Okay, so it's 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 a little hard to, to, to figure out, but let, let me say that the, the three letters are Shin Chafna. Those are the three letters. Okay. Now, what is the word Shin Chafna? Give me some vowels underneath it. Anybody? Shochen. Okay. What do you mean? Shachen. Neighbor. Neighbor. How about uh, taking that word Shachen and making it into a Shchuna? It's a Shchuna. Shuna. Neighborhood. Neighborhood. Right? and Shachan simply means to live somewhere. I'm Shochein here. I'm living here. Uh, <coughs> Shachain is a neighbor. We're always told to pick good neighbors, good neighborhood. Shachain is a good neighbor. Shuna is a neighborhood. Uh, <coughs> so it's therefore a dwelling place. That makes sense now, right? One other point is that how would you say, and this you should know, most of you, the name, what's the Hebrew word for God's divine presence in Hebrew? Anybody? Close. Shekhinah. Shekhinah. And that's the same word pretty much, isn't it? Shachay. What the hell about somebody? <clears throat> uh, the, the, the word shachen uh, to dwell uh, means to uh, <clears throat> means to dwell. Uh, well, we really should get a sign in Chibu. We'll do that. Remind me before we leave. Okay, we got a sign in Chibu. Um, yeah, you got to pull the trigger. Uh, Shachem, we'll, we'll do it later. We'll, 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 we'll. Shachem, to dwell. Shechina, the dwelling, a neighbor. Uh, the Shechina dwells. The Shechina dwells in the Mishkan. In other words, Mishkan makes a lot of sense. It's the word of dwelling. It could mean person's dwelling, but if you use the concept of Shechina, the divine presence of Hashem, then the divine presence of Hashem. So the divine presence dwells in the Mishkan. It's also true that the divine presence dwells in the Mikdash, in the Beit Mikdash, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, the, uh, the, the, the whole place of holiness. It also is true that we refer to our current shoes and synagogues today as a Mishkan Ma'at, as a mini replica of the temple. And uh, of the of the holy dwelling place of Hashem, and this is therefore uh, a place of the Shechina as well. It would therefore be prudent to suggest that if you come to Shul, you should act with proper reverence. So the predecessor of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem was the mobile temple uh, in the desert that the Jews assembled and reassembled over and over again while they traveled. <clears throat> The Mishkan was the forerunner of the Beit HaMikdash. The Beit HaKnesset today is the, there's one over there. The Beit HaKnesset today is the continuum of that in a smaller fashion. Either way you go, the Shekhinah is present. Would it be fair to say that the Shekhinah was more present 
and greater felt and greater manifest in Jerusalem than here? Absolutely. Uh, would it be fair to say that the Shekinah was greater in the Beit HaMidash in Yerushalayim more than any other synagogue in here throughout the Eretz Israel of Yerushalayim? Absolutely. There was a powerful Shekinah. <clears throat> How do you sense that? How do you feel that? How do you uh, experience that? How do you experience being near, near God? How do you experience a, 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 a real closeness, a real closeness to the extent where it's a, a moment of revelation, so to speak, and it's also a, a concept where God becomes a little bit more real to you at every single experience moment. That's the, the goal of life. Now, <clears throat> can you experience the Shekinah um, by going to the uh, forest and looking at the trees and gazing at the stars and the heavens? For me, my favorite place is the ocean and, uh, and, and, and seeing the, and feeling the, 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 the waves and, and uh, feeling the, 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 the expanse of Hashem. Whatever it is that takes you to a moment of meditation, a place of meditation, and, uh, and, 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 a, and a chance for tranquility and quietness. Enjoy. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, that really is uh, experience of Hashem. And yet, we feel that you can experience Hashem more in the shul, in the synagogue, than in the world, in the most beautiful places. Um, why? Children, stone, wood, whatever. What makes this place we're sitting in right now so special, so different? Or for stars, it was cold. We all say for Um We also know that as far as the safety code is concerned, persons do. Uh, you know what? Let's leave it there and I'll, I'll send it out to the text later. Let me buy the link now. So let's say, uh, <clears throat> let's say uh, that um, um, a person has a mitzvah to own his own safe guitar. Nowadays, the way to perform that is uh, to buy books. At home, for books, home for the total learning. By owning the safe guitar. Um, if you have a safe guitar in your own home, does that give it a status of, of, uh, of a holy place of Hashem? To an extent, that's true. Um, but if it's not a place where people gather, people meaning at least a minimum of a minion, a minion or a minimum of 10 adult males uh, to gather and pray to offer praises of holiness to Hashem. Um, what, are, what are some of the prayers <coughs> that are offered praise to Hashem? We call it prayers of holiness. Who can name me some prayers of holiness that can only be recited when 10 adult males gather together? Kedusha. 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 Right? We all put our feet together and we respond with the chaz of the feet to the Amida. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. All right? I don't believe that. <clears throat> that can only be done when it's a minute. Um, of course, 10 is a magic number. We'll learn about it uh, later on. And uh, of course, I guess your original source of that is your 10 fingers, your 10 toes, there's 10, right? Um, 10 is a completion. Avram Avinu begged Hashem to save the wicked city of stone. Uh, there were actually five cities. And he started and, and negotiated with Hashem. If there's 50 tzaddikim, would you save them? Hashem said, yes. And he went down to 40 and 30 and 20 and 10. Why was the negotiation uh, have some merit? Because he said, if there's not 50, maybe there's four. He'll say four cities. If there's 30, he'll say three cities, 22 cities, and one city. 10's got that, that specialness to it. And that 10, um, is your, uh, your minion, uh, ten, uh, ten, 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 
You have the Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. What else is there besides Kadusha? Kadish. First, we have to recite the Kadish for a loved one who's passed away. Because we all said that special response, A, Shmei, Rabba. That's a powerful response. More talks about it. More says that if a person says the hey, Shmei, Rabba properly, carefully, and with all his heart and meaning, he can tear up a bad decree of 70 years against him. The one was silent. So, uh, uh, and of course, the reading of the Torah, Baruch Hu, these are the various things that you only know with the meaning, which you don't have at home, even if you don't have a sacred Torah. Now, maybe, <clears throat> let's say, uh, there's a place which gathers for a minion once every week, let's say, the shop is so week. So, if it doesn't gather there every day, I'm not sure it has the moving of a Beit HaMikdash Ma'at, of a mini replica of a Mishka. It's got to be a place where there's a daily minion, where there's a gathering every day, every Shabbat, uh, for the recital of holy things. And then you got a shul. And the shul <coughs> is the mini replica <coughs> of the um, of what was once was in Yushalayim, what was built in the desert, which we're talking about here. And here the divine presence resides. But the divine presence is everywhere. So we'll answer that question in a moment. But for now, let's just say that if in fact this place here that we're at right now does have an extraordinary amount of holiness in it. Um, and ensure there is sense of Hashem, one of the most important and prudent and appropriate ways of behavior in this place would be to refrain from talking. That doesn't mean you, you obviously talk or dabbling or learning or expressing the point, but have private conversation, the coming and start socializing, salutations, how are you, what's the latest, you know. And when you see people do that, sure, you know, and it's really, you talk about being socially inappropriate, and that's certainly a, 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 a part of that. Now, in certain shuls, I mean, they, 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 people like to do that. I claim, once again, and this is a, um, just me, but I'm, others agree with me, it is socially inappropriate. Uh, <clears throat> and um, there are people that, 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 that simply won't. My, my Rebbe, Rav Noah was so careful not to talk in the shul, they wouldn't even greet people with the house. He'd wait till he walked out to the hallway to say the child's people. He'd nod or smile if people approached him, but he would not uh, say it um, because it's a holy place. Because it wise the whole thing to have a place. It's a total the gathering, the gathering on a regular basis. Um, but we're going to say something else in just a moment. Well, let's go further here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, we're talking about the um, uh, the construction of the uh, uh, tabernacle or mishkan was made necessary because of Israel's lapse into virtual idolatry. Israel lapse. We all lapse. We talked about that many times. We talked about the fact that the Jewish people made progressive uh, steps in their growth as a people to become God's nation, every step of the way was important as a contribution. Well, the first step that the people took in this book of Exodus, the book of Shemot, the second book of the Torah, what was the first step that we took towards becoming God's people? Go way back to the beginning of this book. The first step we took was becoming God's people. Simon. That's maybe one of the last steps. <clears throat> beginning. That's the very beginning. That's not really community effort. Before that, uh, I say slavery. Stop working. Huh? Stop working. No? Stop work? Or the slavery. Um, Are you thinking? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Slavery meant learning to be submissive, which is important. If you want to be a godly person, you want to accept God's dominion, control. But slavery is also important uh, because it is the, the sense of going through difficulty and challenge 
that is part of the process of becoming a person, a good person, and a holy person, and a godly person. The first step of becoming a godly person, becoming godly people, or becoming a Jewish people is you don't be difficult. And we are no strangers to the world. We're no strangers to challenge. We're no strangers to persecution. We're no strangers to suffering. That's the first step of the future. Then we will serve. Second step is to watch the punishment given to those who oppress us. That we know God's with us. And to know God's with us is to suggest that when God made those 10 plagues, right? Each one of them had this amazing ability to stop at the point where the Jews were and only affect the Egyptians. The darkness was here, not there. So the Egyptian wanted to go there to get some light. He found that the darkness followed him. Blood. Was the, was the first plague, place of war. So if a Egyptian picked up a cup of water, it turned into blood. If he put it down, he didn't want to drink it. And a Jew picked it up, it turned back to water. So the Egyptian took it from him because he wanted some water, and it turned back to blood. <laughs> right? There's an absolute distinction between Israel and Egypt. That's the next step of becoming a godly people. The first step, Pesach, the celebration of our freedom. The sacrifice of their God to our God, the Lamb. Fourth step, the departure, the splitting of the sea, merging in total freedom. The fifth step, the Torah. The sixth step, the kind of Torah that leads to a proper society. And that was last week's parasha. I just described to you the first six parshas in this book. One, two, three, four, five, six. We're today holding in parsha number seven. True. So the first six steps, try to memorize. The first six steps of freedom. Of, of how to, of the first six steps of how to become God's people. Which Torah is the, is the apex, as, as we will say. Right? So we said, <clears throat> Slavery, punishment uh, of the of the uh, of the oppressor, celebration uh, of, of freedom, freedom itself, and then the giving of the Torah and a flat application of the Torah to our society. Number seven says the next step to becoming those people is to build to Hashem this um, this this uh, this Mishnah. I might say um, the eighth step would be next week. In the designation of the special officers of the Mishkan, which will be the Kohan. But then comes the ninth step in two weeks, which is the tragedy of the Golden Calf. Israel lapses into idolatry. And that's part of us, too. That's part of our national existence. We do make mistakes, we do err, we end up, we do mess up. Uh, which, of course, does imply, therefore, the part of our essence. Is tshuva. Is tshuva is repentance. Jews, people will will will, will mess up and make and uh, make mistakes. <coughs> but mistakes are followed with tshuva. It is an opportunity to change. An opportunity to become better. An opportunity to change my life. An opportunity to fix whatever I'm messing up. So that's why we have the Mishkan. He says here as what would happen if the Jews elapse into idolatry? He maintains, let's read further, that ideally no devil should have been needed after the revelation at Sinai with the entire nation achieved a level of prophecy and every Jew was worthy of the Shechina to rest upon him as it later on in the tabernacle of the temple. I read that too fast. <laughs> okay? Uh, the the, the um, <clears throat> The Sforno is, is, the, is the commentary he's quoting. That's uh, uh, on the sixth line, uh, is the, or the seventh line is the commentary on Sforno. Sforno on line nine maintains that ideally we don't need a temple. We don't need a Mishkan. Yeah, after Revelation, we all achieved a level of prophecy. Every Jew is worthy of Shekhinah. 
We all experienced the Shekhinah. We heard, I am the Lord your God, you have all the gods. We all heard it. We all experienced Hashem's, Hashem's reality. In fact, we all died. We all remember the story. And now we're trying to, to, uh, to, to, um, to become, um, <clears throat> we're trying to become uh, uh, a, 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 or, or actually come, come back to life. And Hashem brings us back to life. And Moshe Rabbeinu gives us the rest of the teachings, as we, as I taught when I said Torah Tziv and of Moshe, that Moshe taught us the Torah. But, but the, the key here is the realization that uh, <clears throat> we all experience Shina in its most manifest sense. But then we say we die. Why would a person die if he manifested, if he experienced? The total manifestation of my presence. Too much. Why is it too much? What's happening? So let's understand the vast difference between the human being and God. God's the creator, you have the created. What does that mean? That means that, that basically uh, Hashem uh, does not have any of our limitations. Limited by time and space. Remember those two lessons: time and space. Being limited by time and space means I can't be in more than one spot at time. And by time, I don't have. Uh, we all have uh, beginnings. We all have ends. Moments of experience that begin, continue, and end. Um, and uh, we have the end of life. The end of life. God is nothing. Else. So when we try to think about that and, and, and close our eyes and try to think about the eternal forever, there's no way we can grasp it. There's no way. It's, it's beyond imagination. But we know it's true. We can't describe it. But we know it's true because, because we know he's not us. He created us. So whatever limitations we have, he doesn't. So therefore, clearly, <clears throat> Shem, has no beginning or end. Has no beginning. Could you imagine such a thing? <laughs> Where does it start? Right? How many children ask their parents, hey, Daddy, who created God? <laughs> Where did God come from? Where did God start? Where did God, when was God born? <laughs> right? And, it, and of course, we understand that it's children asking because that's where we were. At. We're asking the when children. We're asking the same thing. I don't get it. I mean, I don't get it. You know, it's real. Knowing that, and then coming to close to that, it comes to a point where it overtakes us. When it overtakes us, what happens to us is that concept of eternity or everywhere begins to overtake us. And then it overtakes our bodies, which are limited, to the point where the body falls away. And that manifestation of eternity and forever and omnipresent all of a sudden puts the body in jeopardy. And the body walks. Moshe Rabbeinu was at Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights and he wants to learn Torah from God. Let's take a look at it. Um, let's take, go back to 443, verse 12. One page back. <clears throat> Hashem told Moses, ascend to me to the mountain, Mount Sinai, and remain there. And I shall give you the stone tablets, right? The two tablets, the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Statements, and the teaching and the commandment that I've written to teach them. That's a whole bunch of stuff God's given Moshe Rabbeinu. Let's try that again. Count how much stuff God is giving Moshe Rabbeinu in verse 12. How much stuff? Well, anybody want to, want to, want to, anyone want to enumerate any of those stuff? Give me one thing, somebody. So the what? The the no, that's not, that's what he did. I don't know what he got at the mount. And it says, I shall give you there. He's giving him something at the mount. Giving the whole, I claim he's giving a whole bunch of stuff. What's he giving for a starter? He started with the tablets. Okay, what else did he get? The teaching, two. What else? Three. 
And? No, we already had that. No, the, no, that I have written. Something written there is number four. Teach them is number five. Let me think what those five stand for. Number one of the talents. So let me, I don't got to tell you that. You know that. The teaching. What is the teaching? So the Hebrew word for a teacher is a, is that a more? More. A female teacher is more. Right? How about uh, teachers? More. Is that correct? How about parents? Anybody? Hori. But it's all the same shonish. It's all the same. Uh, again, we're looking for the root word. The root word is uh, the root letters are here, Rash and Hay, so to speak. Uh, Hora, Mora. How about Torah? The teaching means the Torah. The teaching means the Torah. The Torah is really basically the five books. So I gave you two tablets and five books. Maybe you all know Torah has five books, right? Okay. I gave you two tablets and five books. Then I gave you the mitzvah, right? The commandment. How many? 613. I gave that too. Within the five books, as you read it and learn it, from parsha to parsha to parsha, you will find 613 directives. So I gave you two tablets. I gave you with the basics. Then I gave you the Torah, the five books. Then I gave you the 613 commandments. That's three things that Hashem gave Moshe Rabbeinu at Mount Sinai. What else did he give him? That I have written. The writings. What writings? The writings are the other books. The prophets. And the Nevi'im was in it. Yeah, very good. The Nevi'im and the Ketuvim. Um, now we all know that the Nevi'im and Ketuvim, uh, we make an acronym out of that. We the Torah. We've got Torah, T, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, C-H, or Ketuvim, that's Tanakh. That is the Bible, the Tanakh, basically. The idea of that is very difficult to understand. I mean, did God really give that Mount Sinai? I thought they were written later on by the prophets. Doesn't mean that God gave these things at Mount Sinai. What does that mean? And then again, did God give all five books of Mount Sinai? Did he? He gave the first one. And the, oh, but he told it to Moses. And subsequently, throughout the journeys, he said, go and write this, write that, write that, write that. By the end of his life, uh, comes, uh, on the cusp of Eretz Israel, then he finished the whole, the whole the document, including the 613. But he gave them all to Moshe Rabbeinu in his teaching. In other words, as he's teaching Moshe, what's he doing? He's teaching Moshe um, the, the, all the meanings behind the two tablets. And he's teaching him all the messages of the five books, all the stories. Maybe not details of the stories, but certainly the concepts of the stories and everything that will unfold in the five books was given on Sinai. It was written later on. Can you grasp that idea? Now, God is giving the 613 right now, even though they'll be learned later on. The Jews will have to say, Nasev and Nishma, I'm willing to do, even though I don't know because you haven't told it to me yet. Right? It was just the essence of conversions, we said. So, this here is an amazing events going on at Mount Sinai between between Hashem and Moshe and Yeshua. No, well, sorry. It says it, Yeshua's there too. Where is it? It says, it says uh, Moshe stood up with Yeshua and so Moshe is ascending the mountain, right? Okay, read that again. She ascended to the mountain. He's reading verse 13, folks. Okay, go read it. Moshe and Yeshua. Moshe stood up with Yeshua. Right. Why would Yeshua not Read it properly. And Yeshua said, Read it properly. And Moshe ascended to the mountain of God. So, what are you saying, man? You're not reading right. Come on, you're not reading, don't you? Was Yeshua with him or wasn't he? 
How do you know that? Part of the way. On the way. Thank you. When it, when it going got a little too hot, that's when the you know, sure said that. Okay. <laughs> the two of them stood, but he went up. Read right. Sorry, no, I'm That's testing you. Are you okay? Yes. <laughs> I like the test. Yeah. I know, Michael. This way. I don't want to cross. Don't worry about it. Okay. Michael, don't cross. Don't go. That's Michael, folks. Does <laughs> <laughs> anybody know you? Um, so Moshe is up there learning all this stuff. So he learned. Uh, four things, including those four prophecies as well, correct? But then it says that I have written. Oh, no, we saw that. That's the prophecies, right? To teach them. That was number five. How do you teach to teach them? What is the fifth thing God told Moshe? I'm giving you the tablets. I'm giving you the five books. I'm giving you the six books. I'm giving you the messages, the prophets that are going to be the future. I'm giving you everything, including the teachings of the future. Say again. The mission, the tomorrow, and the subsequent teachings, and the subsequent ideas and thoughts, and and infinite amounts of ways of explaining things. Now, this guy Alex over here, right? He just engaged me in this conversation of the Yeshua go didn't you? This conversation was taught. By God to Moshe and Mansa. He said, in the future, Alex and Rabbi Block are going to have this discussion. And they're going to, they're going to figure it out that you sure want just a certain amount. But your contribution is valuable. Because why? Because you did say, and you did bring your show to the picture, which I hadn't done, which is valuable. And then, of course, we invented them, and we, as you said, then far away. But this kind of message, this kind of depth teaching, this kind of insight that Alex just suggested was taught by Hashem to Moshe Rabbeinu at Mount Sinai. Everything will ever be taught. Every message, every every concept, every nuance, every little detail, every little perception was taught by Hashem to Moshe Rabbeinu and our So the Moshe Rabbeinu had super genius. <laughs> I think. His IQ was off the charts. Okay. But that's what it says over here. It says, okay, then Moshe went with Yoshua, but then, as we said, he left Yoshua behind, went up to the mountain. And he told the rest of the elders, you stay here, and I'll return to you. Right? Aaron Achor was amongst them. And now Moshe goes up once again alone on verse 15. Follow me, verse 15. Moshe goes up to the mountain. And the mountain is covered with a cloud. And Verse 16, watch this, folks. The glory of Hashem rested upon Mount Sinai. Give you a Hebrew word for the glory of Hashem. Come on, say it. Shekhinah yeah. again, that's it. The divine presence, the glory of Hashem. The power of Hashem, the awesomeness of Hashem. The essence of the being that does have no, that has no limitation rested upon Mount Sinai and Moshe was there. Miracle, he survived. And he survived. The appearance of the glory of Hashem was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. A consuming fire means, and he survived. He's going to die. He's going to die. Because the body can't sustain, the body that's limited by its limitations cannot sustain the closeness to the, that kind of closeness to the being that is, has no limitations. Because it's too much for the brain to understand. It's too much for us to comprehend. We fall apart and the body moves away. How many people ever remember a movie called Raiders of the Lost Ark? One person, two persons, three, four, okay, we yeah, can get it somewhere. My God, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You ever seen why you're wasting your time watching movies? Ask me. I'll tell you what <laughs> Do not watch current garbage. Any movie that's been produced last 15 years ago, don't even touch. Raiders of the Lost Ark, you saw it? Okay, there you go. Raiders of the Lost Ark is this uh, sort of a fictitious uh, story uh, with uh, this great actor, Harrison Ford, who's this 
you know, mighty man or whatever. I mean, how many heroes? Some sort of uh, mighty man. I don't know. And uh, he's on a search for the lost ark. The lost ark is the ark of uh, that was the last ark in the temple in Jerusalem uh, before the destruction. Somewhere in the world it exists. We believe that. So that part of the movie is true. So listen, a, 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 any, a, nearly every one of the nonsensical movies that Hollywood makes has some basis of truth. There is such an art in the world that contains not the Torah, but the tablets. The tablets were contained in the ark when we moved into Israel when we, and, and was there when we had the bit of the temple. I mean, what did he happen to the, the, the tablets? <laughs> right? Those who bought them now broke the first time, but the second one we got. We got the tablets, what do we do with them? So we, um, we, we put them into the ark, with the Torah, in the Holy of Holies, in the, in the base of the So what happened after the destruction? A lot of stuff was taken away by, in the second destruction, particularly by the Romans. During the first destruction by the Babylonians, we hit a lot of stuff. And we never really recovered the 70 years later when we rebuilt the second temple. So the second temple was missing a lot of stuff. It did not have the same holiness as the first one. After the second year, they said it was destroyed by uh, the Romans. They carried a lot of stuff away. And our contention is that there's still a whole lot of stuff still in the catacombs, the depths, the Vatican, in Rome. They got a whole lot of lost stuff. Um, which they were linked to the Bible, which is probably appropriate to be continued playing. Um, but the ark, according to this fictitious story, is available to anyone who wants to, let's say, uh, uh, maybe achieve eternal life or whatever, one end of the ark. And so, according to this fictitious tale, um, uh, Indiana Jones. Is it trying to, uh, you remember this? Yes. Okay. Uh, go on. It's still somebody. Anyway, and, and, and he's trying to, uh, is it trying to uh, uh, save the ark or, or keep it away from the Nazis. Uh, the and the Nazis are trying to get it. Uh, they figure that they're, they're in their pursuit of, uh, of, of, of killing oh. Jews. What? The, oh, the power. Right? Eventually, uh, our hero does not prevail. <laughs> uh, and uh, he's busy with, uh, protecting his damsel in distress, you know. In Hollywood, you have to protect the girl. <laughs> anyway, see, he's busy doing that. And uh, uh, not, not that he really has any real uh, romantic interest, but it's really the way it turns out is that the, the, the Nazis do get it, and they're all excited about the fact that they've got the spoils of war for the art. And this will really go, will really destroy the Jews now. Oh, God. And um, so the Nazi drunk of power um, want to open the ark, and the movie has some special effects, which, uh, which really, I, I mean, in the imagination of the movie maker of what the divine presence is supposed to be like or look like. And um, as he opens the ark, our hero tells the damsel in distress, our, our feminine hero, heroine, uh, and tells her, "Don't." Remember that? Don't look. Meanwhile, the Nazi drunk of power, he opens it up, and some whatever comes out that's supposed to be the divine presence or something, right? And uh, in the imagination of the of the, uh, the writer, and the Nazi looks. What happens to the Nazi? And <laughs> oh, it was integration. This integration, right? This face does his whole part of body but, but turns to wax. Actually, it was a, it was the first person that I saw was supposed to be the Cohen Adolf. Right, but they recruited somebody. Well, no, no. The, the essence of, 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 of what's in the art is probably no different than what Hashem, than what, what we experienced when Hashem said the first two statements. <laughs> um, and we don't. And it's so no different than the, the Experience that most Romano had. But if you look further in what we're reading now, you tell me, tell me how long Moshe Romano was there and, and for how long he survived. Is anybody? 40 years. 
right there. Why is there a, a I just, funny thing? Well, they say, why did they specifically say six days? No shoes there for six days, and then there's this. You're gonna test me again, aren't you? you tested me, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it says right here. Uh, Moshe said, a mountain we call it covered mountain, the glory of Hashem resting on the mountain that covered it for a six day period. Correct. Called to Moshe on the seventh day in the midst of the cloud. That's right. So that what that shot is? No, no, those six days, those six days were the first six days of Siva. The one when they in other words, when they got there. When the Jews arrived at Siva at Sinai as a people, so they extract through the desert, right? Right. They got there at the beginning of the month of Siva. Sivan, right? And for six days, the cloud enveloped the mountain. And the seven day, God would live himself. And that's what most of the next day. So now, um, let, let's. Um, so it doesn't say then, it doesn't say when he went up after that. Well, there it does. It just, no, it says. The appearance of the glory of Hashem was like a consuming fire on Mount Tabor before the eyes of the children of Israel. Okay. Moses arrived in the midst of the cloud and ascended. The well, mountain. arrived means to come. Okay, go on. And Moses was on the mountain. He went up on the mountain. It says he went up on the mountain. It says he ascended the mountain. Yes, but it doesn't tell us when he went up. Did he go up on the seventh day or was he already up there waiting on the no, sixth? No, no, day? no, 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 no. He went up on the seventh. The revelation was on the sixth. And that's except what we now know today is the sixth of Sivan, the Shmuz, the Rule of the Shmuz. Um, basically, again, this is all happening, uh, and Moshe Rabbeinu is surviving. He's surviving for 40 days. And Moshe Rabbeinu managed to learn the whole wisdom of the whole world and the whole Torah and everything else we talked about before. And that passage uh, was, um, uh, was, of course, incredible, a genius, and uh, what was most incredible is that he survived. And that close proximity of God, which means that we couldn't survive more than two statements. I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other God. Most of us was able to survive the whole thing. But if you really want to know what took place during those 40 days, let's turn the page. Um, um, turn the page. Uh, 505. There's no food, no water, anything up there. No food, no water, no. How do you make? How do you manage? Come on, tell me, how do you manage? How do you manage without food and water? You do because you don't need it. When you're in that kind of state, you don't need it. Now, let's face it. We do this once a year. You don't keep it. Are you hungry? Not really. Are you thirsty? Not really. I mean, a little bit here and there, good. But if you're really focused on the Nominee, on Yom Kippur, who's thinking about food? Yeah. I'm thinking about Shem. Who's All right. Now, I know there are people that can't wait for the show for the sound and rush out to the, to, to, to the nearest water fountain, right? <laughs> Basically, we, we, you know, when I was conducting my show, we never did. When the show was sounded uh, at 45, about 45 minutes after the sunset, um, we uh, uh, spent another 30 minutes before we ate. We spent it praying the evening service of the new day. We spent it dancing to the Joys of Jerusalem. We spent it doing the mitzvah of the sanctification of the new moon, which we do every month. And we did it for this month of Tishrei. And then we had Havdalah. Because it, it, it's, a, it's a Shabbat and that deserves a Havdalah. A, a, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the statement of the, the, the separation for the rest of the week. And of course, in so uh, doing, we then. Uh, the bike and a brush on Shako, Motsi, Money Bread, or whatever. If you're really that much into it, you really don't have that much of a need of drive, unless you really weren't very much into it. <laughs> service. And so you were really not, not, not really 
thinking, focusing, or, or feeling, or experiencing. So you want to do it. But if you, you, we can will ourselves into a spiritual being, but we can't do more than one day. Maishu Rabbeinu, and you want to get a perspective of who this individual was, did it for 40 years. And well, you get the supernatural element? No, no. It, it just a, a person can. Can you fast two days if you need to? But it got to be it's kind of with a kind of motivation, dedication. I mean, the, uh, um, two persons are suffering in the hands of the Nazis and then the Holocaust. One dies, one survives. That's the difference. One probably gave up and never will to live. One felt it was imperative to live, to survive, to build a future, and to get out of this misery, and then and, and that one day Hashem will redeem us and, 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 and save us, just like He saved us from Egypt, and we'll be and we'll, we'll free again and build our lives once again in, in, in God's service. But it's all mindset, really. Mind over matter. Who pray? It can be done. I would try it 40 days. <laughs> uh, there is a passage that says, a, a, a ruling that says, what is the uh, after effect if you see a Torah fall on the floor? Uh, what is the after effect of Torah? What, 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 what should you do? Uh, oh, yes. Maybe yes, ask for it. But assuming that there are only 40 people, you have a 40 day fast. Why 40 days? Because the Torah was given in 40 days to Moshe. If the Torah now has fallen to the floor, so the reality is, is that, is that it, it, it's almost like being taken away from us. We want it back. We need another 40 days of fasting, like Moshe Rabbein. No food, no drink, which we can't do. So during the 71 earthquake, which most of you were around for, and the uh, 94th, right? The 94th, you know, okay? We came into the shul early in the morning, and they're all bumper before early in the morning. We came into the shul and found all the toes that fallen out of the ark onto the floor. Needless to say, we were, uh, we, we were devastated uh, emotionally. We were loving and kissed the toes from the back of the ark. Um, and we could uh, issue that he did with myself and other rabbis. Everyone can really is required to fast for this tragedy that's happened to us. The idea, of course, of Moshe of being doing this is his unique ability. We have the ability to hold on to our sense. This special experience that Moshe had um, was then, in a way, Placed in the Mishkan when it was constructed, and it was placed in the in the uh, subsequent permanent structure in Jerusalem. So you had to be very very careful how you entered this holy place. If you were impure, you were disallowed on the Temple Mount. To this day, since we all are impure, because all of us have come in turn in touch. One way or another, we're dead with a funeral or, or a corpse or a coffin. So none of us are allowed to go up and come down. And, and uh, the purification ceremony for that, which some we'll get into much later, is this weird or odd ceremony called the burning of a red cow, um, which we'll talk about. But um, we don't have a red cow today. And some say that the red cow, a sighting of a red cow, would be. Uh, it would be a sign that Mashiach is here, that we can do the ceremony and allow us now to come and ascend the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem, of course, is uh, was surrounded by four walls. And one of those walls still stands. That's the Western Wall, the Kotel. Um, some want to say, this is a Medrash that says it actually, Never says one of the writings of the of the Talmudic era that says that the divine presence of Hashem never left the Western Wall. 
So now, how many of you have ever did that? How many of you have ever been to the Western Wall? You've been to the Western Wall. So to go there, and you will see, of course, a lot of prayers and a lot of the beseeching of Hashem and, and, and the people davening and so forth. It's a place where you can connect with the divine presence of Hashem in a very limited fashion. But still, should you be schmoozing at the wall? Should you be taking pictures at the wall? Should you be uh, uh, having an ice cream at the wall? What is this here? Bowling alley? <laughs> Think about it. This is the holy temple of Jerusalem, where the divine presence used to reside, which had resided before in the portable Mishkan that moved from place to place in the desert, which we built right after the Torah was given. After the Torah was given, we were, uh, in a sense, uh, of course, um, uh, uh, in a uh, holy state, but then, as I said, we all descended. Well, that's part of the human spirit, part of the Jewish spirit. We descended and made a mistake. We made a terrible mistake. What was the mistake? We worship the golden calf. Uh, worship the golden calf. Most of our brain took the tablet and broke it. Why did it break it? So that we wouldn't be suffering under the, the radiation of the law. That's a good point. That's an excellent point. I'd study that around a lot. Now, yes, yeah, I, the, there's an info right down the street. I'm like, oh, I'm going to send you a date, Alex. We've got to get you in that water. Can you swear? <laughs> like a fish? Like a fish. <laughs> I, I'll be on my card. <laughs> I have this sense of, of, of sin, this sense of, um, of Moshe Rabbeinu breaking the tablets. Because, as Alex said, if the tablets were in existence, we have a lot to answer for. So Hashem gave us this break, so to speak. Um, also, while it protected us, it protected the tablets. The tablets could not sustain itself, could not coexist with the golden calf. How would you feel if, let's say, someone walked into the synagogue uh, with an iron? iron or walked in the shul with a cross? Most disturbing. Most disturbing, right? So really, the Jews worshiping the golden calf, actually, it was like, it, it was so horrible, so disgusting, that it was like you took the holy tablets or a holy book or anything holy and walked into a bathroom. You gotta get it out of there. You can't get it in there either. And uh, you, you have to get rid of the proximity of holiness to the unholiness, so to speak. So this is also a free will. This is also a free will conversation. Right? Among your men. Well, right, well, well, I have two questions actually. One is, they're flying today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 um, would Moshe have been subject to if, if they if he had presented the, the commandments to the to the to Israel, would he have been subject to them as well? What was God's uh, response to Moshe? What was God's response to Moshe being breaking the tablets? Anybody? He was going to destroy. He was. Who was going to destroy the people? What did you say? He was going to destroy the people. So this saved the people. So that, that, that little Moshe. Right, right, right. That's what he said. Moshe. Moshe. Is uh, what is the word? Not right for the people. Right. Save them. Well, that's no, no, no. Moshe saved the people. Moshe saved the people. Moshe had something else. But the fact is that you, 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 you what Alex no, said that, earlier was that. The the the, the, uh, the the tablets the Jews would, would not be subject to right. what did you say? He was going to destroy the Jews. All right, so save the Jews, right? That was that was it for him. Um, so what did God say to Moshe Rabbeinu in response to what he did? Back right. up. What? Back up. 
correct. Well, he said something else. He said thank you. He said thank you. He said Yashem Koyach. Where? He said Yashem Koyach that you threw it down and broke it to save the Jews, to save the tablets. So the idea is, is that <coughs> um, well, isn't that like a free word? All right. God knows everything. Right, here's my question. Here's the second. But God knows everything, right? So he, he knew that they were going to make the golden gap. He knew that Moshe was going to go there and he was going to see the golden gap. Right. So it was like an exercise in. Well, that's everything in life. Right? That's everything in life. God knows the part you're going to do this mistake. So why is he let you do it? So was it was the was the less was the real lesson um, um, uh, uh, Yeshua? Yes, that, that, that is that, mm -hmm. that's the cool. idea. The idea is, is that the human experience, the, the Jewish experience, is the mistakes that are made and the opportunity for Chuba to save the day. The point is, is that we all have to go through it, even if God knows it, because that's part of being mm -hmm. alive being, and, 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 and living. We have to do what we have to do, uh, including accepting the fact that we do make mistakes, and God accepts that too. That's why he provides the opportunity for Jew. And so that's why Moshe Rabbeinu breaks the tablets. But I want to focus in on the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu protected the Jews, protected the tablets, is the concept that when the manifestation of Hashem is too much, it'll kill the Jews. We learned that in the first two, the first two statements of I am Lord your God, your Lord, your Lord. God uttered it, Mount Sinai, on the 6th of Sivan, we all died, God brought us back to life. We uttered it. Uh, once again, you have that same manifestation. Um, you you got to behave properly. I mean, uh, if, if you uh, have the manifestation of Hashem that close to you, and and, and you're uh, um, actually uh, uh, in, in a uh, in a uh, a, uh, a close proximity to kedusha, to holiness, and so forth, uh, you have to be on your guard. Should you be on your guard all the time? Yes, but we don't have that capability. Moshe could only stand 40 days. It's all a good day. It's all a good day. So let's take a look at here. So now on 505, um, um, on 505, uh, Moses says to Hashem in verse 12, uh, you tell me to take the people onward. You did not inform me who you will send with me. And you had said, I shall know you by name and you have found favor in my eyes. So it's Moshe telling God. He's saying, you didn't inform me uh, whom you're going to send with me. And you said that I shall know you by name. Why does Moshe want to know God by name? What's the name? What's the significance of the name? The definition of the name. Of who you are. Right? David, you read Paul. Right? The, 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 uh, the, the uh, difference. So, the difference of the name, if, let's say I close my eyes and I say David. I see his face. I see his face. I, see I say Yehuda instead. I see Yehuda's face right away. The difference between the two people is not their name so much as much as their faces. There are no two faces in the world that are alike. Even sometimes you see the identical twins and his clone. There's always something a little different. Song, right? <laughs> right? Right? You see, you see uh, 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 the son looks just like his father, or the daughter looks like the mother, whatever. Point is, is that everyone's different. So our ability to identify is based upon the difference in the name, but particularly the difference in the appearance. And Moses says, I want to know you by your name. But well, he says to God. You said, I shall know you by your name. And also that I have found favor in your on my eyes. And now indeed, further 13, if I found favor in your eyes, says Moshe to God, make your ways known to me. I want to know everything about you. So that I may comprehend you. Well, this, is a merit. this is a loving, <coughs> Conversation. You have found favor in my eyes and see the station's your people. In other words, I want to know you intimately 
as only two close people can know each other intimately. I want to know you as different than somebody else. I want to distinguish you from God. How can you yell at God? God has no physical form. What's Moshe asking? Moshe is asking Hashem to be able to have him manifest his shechina upon him in its fullest. And survive. And God will answer. Well, let's take a look at this. Okay. Um, let's go now. Uh, Hashem said to Moses at the bottom of the page, 17. Everything you've asked of me, which you spoke about, I shall do. That's what God tells Moshe. Shem to Moses. Everything you asked of me, you want to see me? You want to know me? You want to know my name? You want to look at my nose? You want to see my face? Whatever my nose is, whatever my face is, I grant it to you. Because you found favor in my eyes. And I have known you by name. I know you, Moshe, intimately. I know how sincere you are. I read your mind, which I can from God. I see every action you do is purely sincerely for God, for heaven, for spirituality, for truth. You haven't got a single bone in your body that has a personal agenda. Which, by the way, none of that can have that appear to watch, right? Then he goes further. Page 507. He said, who said? Uh, no. Moses. Moshe. What did he say? I want it. Are you grasping the intensity of this moment? Are you grasping the absolute uh, totality of this intimacy? Of this incredible moment of excitement? <coughs> This is, I this is beyond the burning bush, right? This is this is way beyond the burning bush. We only heal got and of course, well, and, and, and you're gonna have to tell the difference. But hold on. What did God say? Show me your glory. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice to hear from you. I, I shall make all my goodness pass before you, because God is goodness. That's his essence. So essence means goodness, goodness means essence. I'll bring, I'm going to take all my essence in front of you. I shall call out with the name Hashem before you. You want me to know my name? Hashem? I'll, I'll show it to you. Tell you the holy name. Anybody know what name that is? Hashem. Yeah. What name is he telling Moshe Rabbeinu? What name did he tell the Jews when he said, I'm the Lord your God? I am. That's right. The 26, the good name of name. Which we said is pronounced by those witnesses, you know, with the J. We know, of course, it's with a Y, but we're not allowed to say it, right? Because that was the holy name. The same one uh, after the burning bush, right? Uh, not as much, not as much, as much a manifestation. Uh, the, the, when he said, when Hashem appeared to Moshe, the manifestation was less. I'm going to explain to you why it's less than that, because he and Alex asked the same question. The point is that the reason that it's less is because at this moment in time, Moshe is a different person. At the time of the burning bush, he was an exploring, sincerely interested, desirous of truth, desirous of reality, looking for, for God or whatever. Well, he was a man in conflict. Man in conflict, had, trying to find the answers, which we all are. A decent, for the most part, good person, you would be. So oh, God, appears, God appears to him in a limited fashion, but enough to him to understand that there's a truth to this. And that his mission in the trial has to be done. But this is a whole lot different. We got a new Moshe Rabbeinu. Why is he brand new now? Well, he went to Egypt and took the Jews out. That made a difference. So mature. And he had the power of being taken away to his staff. And he split the sea with his staff. Well, he was and him. he heard with everybody else the dead statements. And he heard the other eight that the other people didn't hear. Well, he but here's what's right really why he's different. You know why he's different? What? For what? What did you do? Isn't that when he asked no. Hashem for forgiveness and he was no. after the no. no, no. That's going to happen later, but not for him, for the Jews. The Jews need the 13 attributes. But what? 
has changed him now to all those. What's changed Moshe now? Because of God. You're right. He's there for 40 days now. He's a changed human being. See, the, you ever seen what he put the movie? The Ten Commandments, where they change his face here and it's all glowing or whatever, right? Yeah. Point is, is that he's he, he different. Having had that experience with God, you're, you're not the same person. You're, you're just changed forever. And that's why he gets caught up in the ecstasy and says, I want to know who you are. I want to see your face. I want to experience your name. I know it's all goodness. I want to know the going of the answers. In other words, God, there's trouble in the world. There's suffering in the world. Other people hurting in the world. Other people hurting. The Jews went through slavery, misery, suffering, Nazism, Holocaust, this, that. I want to know the answers. And I know you got it. I know you did it. And you did it for the good. All your truth. Well, it's like a wait a second. Hold, go now. Go to verse uh, and 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 uh, go to verse eight. What does he say? We're saying on five or nine. Five or seven. I'm oh, sorry. Verse twenty. Sorry. So much. I beg your pardon. I can't see well. Uh, uh, verse twenty. Five or seven. He said, "You shall not be able to see my face, but no human can see my face." And live. So then, not even the constitution of Moses changed. Not, uh, yeah, certainly, because he's going to see something, but not even you can survive. Now, but most of them did survive for 40 days. So, as we all learn from here, that our ability to connect with the spiritual in this world is available to us on our level in a limited fashion. Those who are more spiritual more learned, more pious, have a higher level of connection. Those on a lower level have a lower level of connection. Moshe had a 40-day connection. We had the connection of two, of two statements, and we died. But it is everybody until he died. Now, frankly, I, I, at this point in time, it's fair to suggest that Moshe Rabbeinu was ready to die. If, if death Will, and the release of my body will bring me closer to you. What am I waiting for? So we understand now, sometimes with death, we just don't understand. And it's so mysterious and so frightening. It's in fact a blessing. Because what it does at the appropriate time that God says so is, is you're going to go to the school world with me. You're going to come into ecstasy with me. You will rest in peace. You know, all the challenges of this world, you will never have to worry about them again. You will never have to worry about making fun of them, all the more things, having to worry about this or that, or the sniffles, or the stomach ache, or the nosebleed, or the earache, all these little things we have every day. Or sometimes greater tragedies, all through the history, the moment the person is together. Well, and what and what's left? The beauty of the forests, the loveliness of the sea, the sense of the beautiful stars in the sky, the sense of total spirituality, tranquility, beauty, love. All that. Now, certain things will say, well, when can I die? <laughs> I want to die. Come on. I'm, 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 I want this, right? And of course, we learn. That um, that's not supposed to be until God says so. Why? Because um, down here on earth, our task is to try and achieve the best we can, our full power, the best we can, within the confines of our challenges, within the confines of the back door. I got a flat tire. Can I still make it to the shore? And get the trip and get the, the tire fixed so I can get out there to be sure. In other words, we all got these challenges. We got to do, we got to do them, right? Uh, if you want to die, then the challenges are over. But if we want to fulfill God's will, God wants you here to work through the muck and work through the junk and work through the issues 
and build spirituality. So that when it's time to be able to make a smooth transition from life here to life there. And most of who wants it right now, prematurely. Prematurely. Now, there are people going to be lying on. Just with the tragedies, death people, not me. How do you understand? How do, how do you how do you grasp it? And of course, we don't understand that at this time, Hashem saw fit, this person should come to This person has fulfilled all of his or her his or her task. They they they've done well, they, they've accomplished things. And so um Hashem tells Moshe, behold, in verse 20, there's a place near me. You may stand on the rock. Close. Don't go. When my glory passes by, fleetingly, quickly, I shall place you in the cleft of the rock. I shall shield you with my hand until I have passed. But you can't see. I then shall remove my hand. You will see my back, but my face may not be seen. Now, we don't know what back is, we know what a face is. But we do know. The back is less than the face. Everybody got the same back. I mean, if you do these guys stood up and the face was the back, I could tell them anybody. Oh, uh, I could tell them one guy's back and the other guy's back. So what are you seeing? You're not really seeing the, 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 the real uh, individualistic identity. You're seeing the women and not the shadows. There's a Talmudic statement that says that God wears the film. In our film, that God will cross to us. We have the passage, Hero Israel, the Lord's our God, the Lord of God, Shrine's Word. Um, in God's tomb, it says, Israel is one. Almost as if to say that as much as we love God, and He's the only one for us, God says, I love Israel, He's the only one for me. They're the only one for me. A beautiful love relation. Uh, <clears throat> and in this uh, happening, it's still, as you all know, that there's a, a big. Uh, uh, the, the crown on top, the box on top, right? And then there's a, a knot in the back, right? The knot on just in the middle of the back of the, just at the, the bottom of the skull. And um, that's what we say God saw. Uh, Moshe saw. Moshe saw the, the knot of God's tongue. And how much, therefore, of the answer that Moshe wanted to know about God's essence did he get? Some of it. But then Moshe wants more. <clears throat> and so, if you take a look at, uh, uh, at um, go, go back a bit, okay, uh, you will see that um, um, <clears throat> uh, um, you will see on uh, um, on page 496, um, actually 494, 495, at the bottom of the page, Hashem tells Moshe, go descend, go down. Now's not your time, it's to be mature. For your people that you brought up from the land of Egypt have become corrupt. They have strayed quickly from the way that I have commanded. Bottom of 495, on the top of 497, they made themselves a molten calf, frustrated themselves, and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, Israel, which are brought up from the land of Egypt. And so, this terrible betrayal, this terrible adultery of, uh, of betraying God and them getting this new husband called uh, the, God, the Golden Calf is the, <clears throat> and, 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 and the, uh, the entire uh, 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 the, the deceit, the deception that Israel is, 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 is doing to God. <clears throat> is the deception which um, which uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was dealing with. And he says there, Tim, go down. You can't stay here and enjoy your own ecstasy. Because your destiny will be for far more ecstasy, far more intimacy, far more closeness to a spiritual Hashem when you take care of your job down here and your job is not over. So you want to commit suicide because you want to come close to God, it's done. But God hasn't told you that your job's over. And he places it in front of you. 
And then we begin to try to understand the passage this with this concept of this embracing into a new world of Hashem, a new closeness to Hashem, and this new spirituality, which is not accessible in its totality in this world. Is it accessible at all in this world? Yes, it is. Temporarily, not all the time, every place. We can't handle it. We're too physical. And so we have specially designated times when we can come close to Hashem, and Yom Kippur is one of them. Other fast days can also qualify. How about Shabbat? But I refuse to go to work. I refuse to answer the phone. I refuse to drive. I refuse to cook. I refuse to do all those things. Well, I'm, the more physicality I deny, the more spirituality comes to me. Would you agree that God, you can feel more and stronger on Shabbat than any other day? Absolutely. That doesn't mean you can't feel it at all, but limited. Because we can't handle much more than once a week in terms of a, a real manifestation. And if you want to really want a real one, like before, we can't handle more than once a week. Now, you understand something. If we're limited by time and space, in which by time, that means we have a beginning and an end. And by time, it means we can't maintain total spirituality all day and all night of this existence because we have set up to go to work and do all the things we need to do and take care of our bodies and take care of all our other issues. So therefore, we can only have limited closeness to Hashem. Those limited closeness to Hashem is limited by certain times that are more close to Hashem, less physical, Shabbat with people and so forth. But that's time. What about space? If God is everywhere, then you can never say a word to your friend ever because God's watching. But God's manifestation to us also is limited in the terms that the space says only in certain spots, just like certain times, certain spots are going to be real special, where there's going to be a greater, a larger, a stronger manifestation. Here, you know, here. We don't discuss the wall schools. We don't discuss the stock market. We don't discuss uh, real estate. Here is not where you discuss those things. It's a business place for that. This is a place where manifestation of Hashem is stronger. Now, is Hashem in your business place? Sure, he is. But unless that's why you're allowed to do more physical stuff. However, Hashem is more spiritual and the manifestation is stronger. We have to respond with denial and, dis and, and dismissal of as much physicality as possible. That's what Shabbat and Yom Kippur is all about. That's what the Knesset is all about. It's abhorrent that people walk into the shul socializing. <laughs> Let's say the shul doesn't have a dining room and it wants to serve a Kiddush. Let's say. Maybe you've seen some truth like that, small instances. So we're praying, we finish the prayers, and we want to set up the table with the Is that appropriate with you? But it's still not with me. So a lot of people, what they do is they may have a special curtain which extends from here to there to cover the door. And in this way, all of a sudden, the status of this room diminishes to some degree that now you can have a finish here. Um, some say this curtain is there for that purpose. You don't need an extra one. But you got to have that awareness to say that, um, that we have to do something to change the, the physical reality of this place and the spiritual reality of this place and make it into the city of the supposed to be. Certainly, if you go to the Western Wall, goodness gracious, to make a circus out of it, it's ridiculous. If you go to the Western Wall to beseech God, to come close to God. You walk up to the Western Wall and you start to feel the, the power and the energy of the divine presence of Hashem. How do you walk out? My father was a member of the never walked out of the church. Back. Turn the back to He never did. Then, backwards. You walk out backwards and you walk out away from the Western Wall. So 
we get the idea that Hashem has provided us with enough spirituality in this world that we can sustain ourselves within the physical confines, maintain our jobs, do our responsibilities, and rise to the occasion, which is what our life is all about in the first place in this world. So that we can eventually reach there where we need to be after 120 years. So in this world, you got to try your best to be as spiritual as possible, realizing that there are specially designated times and specially designated places. And that's the idea of the instruction of the Mishnah. To the extent that God said, now that I've given you the Torah and taught you the rules, you can't go to Israel just yet. Because you need a place to house the Torah. So that the Torah be revered and honored. You need a place that's going to be specially designated as a Shem's holy place. And that place will be traveling amongst you. So that there's a place of, if you were in a very spiritual mode, for instance, you could come close to the Mishkan in the desert and feel almost as if you are standing back at Mount Sinai again and God revealing himself with the Ten Statements. But if you're not in that zone and you're not there yet, or you're preoccupied with your thoughts, don't come close. Don't harm yourself. Don't put yourself in jeopardy. Know what you can do, what you can. If the best you can do is Yom Kippur, that's swell. You can do more. If you're holier, maybe a day rabbi. I saw one rabbi in the yeshiva in Queen when I was a boy. He stood the entire day of Yom Kippur. He was dressed in white, which we were then shell bar with the Kali, and he stood the entire day. Didn't say a word to anybody for the entire day. My son wants to. <laughs> I think he doesn't do it anymore because he got kids and grandkids to worry about. He, he, he did it for the entire day. Um, uh, he was about 18 at the time. He didn't want to try to do something that he didn't want to do. The idea is, of course, that. That, um, that these are special moments, and you want to manifest them and magnify them. So uh, <clears throat> we need to have these opportunities in this world. We've got a Shabbat as an opportunity. We've got a Mishkan as an opportunity. We've got a special place and a special time, special time, special place. And that's the idea of building the Mishkan. Uh, we've got really a, a, a great way to <laughs> sidetracked by what I really wanted to accomplish with, with the fireship, but I just bring to your attention um, on page 444, the actual uh, parasha itself, Truma, which is all about the development of the Mishkan, and give you these as a little uh, little gift. Um, these are called the items of the Mishkan in the uh, of the items in, in, of the Mishkan that was used in the uh, in the uh, uh, building of, of the mission. These, these were uh, uh, used in the building of the Mishkan. Uh, <clears throat> and they are called. And you'll find them, by the way, in the passage on, on 445, verse 3. The truma that should be taken is a truma that will be gold, silver, and copper. You can see it? Verse three, verse, verse three. Uh, the the, the, the uh, truma that shall be taken uh, to, uh, to, to the, the truma, of course, is the idea, take the truma and a portion of, of a gift of stock up, of charity from every man whose heart motivates him, who shall take my portion, and you'll be taking in verse three, gold, silver, and copper, and in verse four and five and, 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 six, and, and five and six, a whole bunch of other stuff as well. In taking all these things, we are going to take them from the people. That means to say that there will be tax collected that will collect um, your gift or your portion. But it says there that the gift thing that you're going to be giving is a gift that is at the generosity of your heart. Is that what it says? Um, and, um, uh, was, whose heart motivates him, right? You gotta, gotta be, it's got to be your heart. We've got to be give this gift generously, not reluctantly. So you got to give this gift, right? So <clears throat> what do we mean to take it? We're going to take it. There's going to be appointed people who take it from everybody. 
Everybody can participate. So we all take it and we all get it for everybody. And everyone's given a different amount because everyone's got different abilities. And everyone also has different levels of generosity. Right? So you know, whatever your utmost reach, it's ten dollars, it's not a dollar, it's about a dollar. Whatever, you know, you in giving stuck up, let me remind you of three factors in the giving of stuck up. And that is called there are three recipients you want to give to. One is the needy, two is the Mishkan, the temple, the synagogue, the shul. You want to give to whatever you can to create a place of the presence of Hashem. You create this place, you build this place, you contribute to the shul. What have you done? You have brought the Shina here. Now you can do that also on a personal level too. So by coming, personally, the first 10 people. Nine showed up, there's no Shechina. Ten showed up, you got it. So you want to be able to, to, um, to create a, 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 um, a level of, of, uh, of, of a Shem's presence. You, you got to give to that. You gotta, and again, that's giving away from yourself physically. Stuck up, builds you up spiritually. Whenever you give, it's not so much if he receives it, it's more important if you've given it. And so uh, here comes a poor man. He says to me, please, Rabbi, help me. I, I, I need some stuff. So I go to my pocket. I go for a $5 bill. I take it out. And I ready to give it to him. I got some gifts. So he says, many things you wanted to do. That's all it comes. He wasn't here to see it. It's unfortunate. Maybe you won't have the, uh, in a sense, maybe you feel disappointed and get the, the, get through the mix of completely what you really wanted to do. So therefore, certainly uh, you will do whatever you can to, uh, to, to, to find the next poor guy or whatever. Uh, the point is that the important part of giving stuff up is not that the recipient receives it, it's rather that you will get a relinquish it, that you put your hand in your pocket. That's the bottom line. Okay, so it's stuck up, has to be given in a way in which, um, in, in, in which you are giving, motivated by your heart, your generosity, and you're giving it to the needy, you're giving it to the sure. And then the third gift, to give to those that are learning Torah. Those that learn Torah, scholars, teachers, rabbis, who let's say are learning all day in various high level organizations called the Coldale or other such uh, uh, places where young marrieds live on the substandard conditions, much less than they, 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 they're very smart young men. They could certainly go out and get great jobs and make a lot of money, but they decided instead to devote their time to learning. Are supporting them and supporting a the needy and the presence of Hashem at the same time, because they're sitting in the base marriage all day in the shul and learning, or whichever shul it may be. And so therefore, those are the three levels of giving. The needy, the divine presence of Hashem's presence in the shul, and on the community, we're building a new community, and build a shul. Five new families, ten new families moving to this new area in the middle of nowhere, and the shul. And of course, you gotta go to mitzvah, and the school, and all, all the things that, that a shul, that a community needs, but the first one is a shul. And, uh, and, and, and yeah, we now have a share on this. And, Torah and then, of course, the third thing is to support Torah learning in our community. Um, in doing all of this with generosity, this is called stuff and giving. This is uh, diminishing our physicality and enhancing our spirituality. Uh, so we call this taking. Uh, first line, speak to the children of Israel and let them take. Why are you taking the portion to give to the stuff? Because you're taking back much more. Then you're giving in terms of your achievement, in terms of your spirituality and generosity. Why does it say, and why is it called teruma? Because the word teruma means in the Hebrew raise. And raise means that you've taken something mundane, like money, and raised it up for a spiritual purpose, for the gift, for the need, for the poor, for generosity, for stuff. So now, the three items we're going to put into the Mishkan, among others, is gold, silver, and copper. See it? Okay. How do you say the Hebrew word for gold? Anybody say the extreme left? Yeah. Say it again? Yeah. Zaha. How do you say the Hebrew word for silver? Kesef. And how do you say the Hebrew word for copper? Nechoshet. See it? 
Okay. You will notice that I have didn't done a numerical value to each letter, but not to the vowel. We don't count vowels and have letters. So in Zahab, I have Zion, which is seven, Hey, which is five, and the Vet, or Vet, which is two. So let's see that. Um, <clears throat> that represents the seventh day, the fifth day, and the second day. The three days during the week that we will read the Torah, Monday, Thursday, and Shabbat. So let's see that. Clear? The next one, Kesef, the K, S, and the F, is the Kaf, which stands for the name Yom Kippur. The Samach, which stands for the holiday of Sukkot. And the Pei, or the F, the P is interchangeable for the holiday of Pesach and Purim. The Nun, Nechoshet, stands for the word Nair, the candle of Hanukkah. The Chet stands for Chodesh, the new month, Rosh Chodesh, and Rosh Hashanah, which occurs on Rosh Chodesh. And of course, the SH stands for Shemini Atzeret, right? And also stands for Shavuot. I don't know why it's not written there. It should be. It should be for Shavuot as well. Shemini Atzeret is Shavuot. And the top at the end stands for Tani, which is fast days, or the Torah, the holiday of Torah, which is Simchat Torah. What does all this mean? Basically, the gold and silver and copper represent are all the days of the year in the Torah is read. This is your checklist. These are the days during the year in the Torah is read. It's a Monday, Thursday, and Shabbat of every week. It's also read on various holidays. All those that are intimated in this chart here. Intimated by the words gold, silver, and copper. So when we want to think about the real presence of Hashem in our Mishkan, the items that went into the building of the Mishkan, it was those items that would allude to, that would hint to the Torah. The real presence of the Mishnah is the Torah. And how do we have a, how do we have some sort of reminder of the Torah? By these three items, which represent the days on which the Torah is read in every single uh, day of the year. So with this will stop. I mean, that went a little too late. Um, your reminder. My reminder. Oh, right. There is a very, a, a big tragedy happening in the audience. Um, um, you can look, find it out online. Um, there's a family in LA called Pizuri. They had a tragic car crash. Um, wife and Laura was killed. Husband and five children remained. Um, there was a fund that has been established to help them through this crisis. Uh, so if you want to give charity to this fund, uh, look up online. The Izuri family. I'll forward it to the group right now. Uh, you, you know that? Okay, so uh, uh, this is uh, something that you want to be able to participate in today. Big tragedies happen to our community. Uh, please take these home. Please study them, remember them. Because they will ask you a question on the test, or because we all know. When is the poll read? They're near. Now you know. And that is the representative. What is Torah? Zahav, Kesef, and Hosha. Gold, silver, and That is what Torah is all about. And so, um, uh, Mr. Shem, we'll meet on Monday. Please, before you leave, sign in over here. Uh, remember that on Monday, uh, on Sunday,